please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. Hey, welcome everyone. Mark here at Blue Glow Electronics. Part 4B in our oscilloscopes for audio series here where we're actually doing some real life problem solving on the bench, i.e. you guys looking over my shoulder and solving some issues heavily using oscilloscope. A few things about that. One, you know, I'm using a, an oscilloscope heavily in this just to try to show how you could use an oscilloscope to solve things. Doesn't mean I'm necessarily showing the, you the fastest way to solve everything, you know. Uh, I would probably use a combination of a multimeter and a um, oscilloscope along the way to speed things up, but I'm trying to, you know, showcase the oscilloscope's capabilities here. Um, but we may use the digital multimeter a little bit along the journey here as well. Okay, in part 4A we did some troubleshooting on a single-ended amplifier and there are things I showed in that video I'm not going to go back and show in this one. So please watch 4A. Um, I covered some basics of the equipment I'm using and um, isolation transformers, things of that nature that I'd like for you to view. I'm just going to dive right into this amp today. And so that, and then I also misspoke and quoted the pinout for a 12AX7 for what was in that amplifier, a 6EU7 on the front end. 6EU7 is kind of a, a 6 volt variant of the 12AX7 and the, the amplifier will work with either you just have to rewire some pins and, and I quoted the wrong pin so apologize for that. Alright so what do we have on the bench today here in 4B? This is a little push-pull 6BQ5 otherwise known as EL84 amplifier. Push-pull pair here on each channel it's driven by a 12AX7 on the front end on each channel that it plays gain stage and phase splitter. And then it's got a nice little set of output um, transformers here that are fairly beefy. We've got a nice power supply and whatnot. This is one of my favorite little console amplifiers, by the way, a little 30 watt unit. These were used in several different versions of the Sears um, console units that they sold. And gosh, guys, I wish I had all the console units. I bet I've tore down 50 console units in my life or more. And I used to buy them 20, 30 bucks, um, pick them up on a pickup truck, bring them home, gut them out, take these things out of them. Now, now they're worth a lot intact. And we always thought <laughs> they'd be worth a lot just for these amplifiers. Turns out the uh, amplifiers are pretty cheap these days. This one is a little harder to find than, than most, but um, I really like this one. So I think we'll enjoy this video. The good part of today's video, I do not know what's wrong with this one. Unlike the last one that was staged, this one has a problem. Let me flip it up and show you something. Okay, as you can see here, I did a conversion on this unit a few years back. You can see I added a three lug power cord to it and tied off the center to the chassis, which means that the chassis is grounded on this one. Theoretically, I don't need an isolation transformer for what we're doing today, but it doesn't hurt to keep one in line. On the last one, I got some questions. I tied this wire back to my oscilloscope, which is tied back through the mains to earth ground, okay, which means I grounded the chassis of that amplifier. But I knew that was okay because it, um, you know, there wasn't a separate signal path ground from the chassis path ground on that amplifier, and we looked at that together. And anytime I'm working with a two prong device, I just personally like to have an isolation transformer in line. Doesn't mean it's always required, but 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 it's just a nice safety net to have there. Uh, ultimately, I ended up grounding the chassis anyway, like I said. So on this one, I wouldn't even need that because it's getting grounded back through earth mains as well. But instead of having to rely on this ground that goes all the way back through to my power panel and whatnot, I'm going to shortcut that and still clip this on it today to keep my ground as short as possible going back to my oscilloscope. Okay, here's what we did with this amplifier. Now you can see here I added terminal strips and, and that can cap that was on top. It's still intact for aesthetic purposes, but it's disconnected. You know, I put this terminal strip in and these capacitors. You can see I've replaced capacitors here. I totally redid all the old resistors that were in this unit with some new uh, metal oxide um, resistors here. Did some rewiring of the input output. I added all these jacks. You know, this used to be the input jack. This used to be the output terminal strip here for the outputs. You know, I put in these these jacks. So I did a nice job, I think, of, of getting it done. But <laughs> here's what happened. I got the unit done, and I had an imbalance in the two channels. One channel is stronger than the other. And I, I went to enough um, diligence to test the tubes 
and find out that the issue is likely not the tubes themselves. So then I'm going, well, what's, what's wrong? And, and what I really needed to do was dig, dig back into all of this, right? Well, for whatever reason, I had to get to a piece, a customer's piece of gear. So I did that and this kind of got set on the shelf over there. And then I did some cleanup and it got moved from this shelf into the other room. And then I did some more cleanup and it ended up down in the barn at some point. And basically it's fully restored and converted console unit that has an issue that I never resolved. So uh, I knew that in the back of my mind. I went down and grabbed this. It is a great showcase for us to solve. So I have no idea what's wrong. You guys are gonna be getting live troubleshooting over my shoulder as we figure this out today. Based on that, I wanna show you one thing real quick. All right, so here's our signal on this unit right now, right? And I'm fitting in at what looks to be about a 1.3 kilohertz. And I thought I'd show you guys a couple things. One, if I just wanted to watch one of these channels, and then I wanted to come over here and push the button that says voltmeter, and then I can go peak to peak. It'll, it'll then tell me that I've got a 17 volt signal peak to peak being measured on one channel. And then if I turn on the other channel, um, it'll come over here and measure and tell me that I've got 14 volts peak to peak across it. Hmm. Now let's say that again. Top one, 17 volts. Bottom one, 14 volts. Uh-oh. <laughs> Look, here's another thing. I could say time on this. Remember one over seconds is frequency. Then what you have to do is you have to, have to find the top of one of these. Then you have to find the top of another one. And what did I tell you what this was? About a 1.33 kilohertz signal there. So we could, we could see that kind of stuff. But my, my main point was here in showing you there is a difference in the amplitude. And we could have, if we didn't have a digital readout on this, look at this, we could come right over here set one on top of the other and we could easily see that one of these signals has more gain to it than the other now i think there's slightly more at play here and i'm gonna i'm gonna play with increasing the amplitude up here and what are we seeing we're noticing that one of these signals is really starting to clip not only on the top but also let me move the other one out of the way here if you notice on the bottom as well. So it's not able to full swing its swing its full load line here um, from its bias for whatever reason or something's causing it to clip. Maybe there's not enough power supply for it. Something's causing one channel to not perform properly and the other one to perform quite well. I could hook up on the distortion meter over here and show you, but there's a significant amount of distortion difference. One of these is running around a 1% distortion, the other is up around you know, 7 or 8% distortion um, without even getting into this level of clipping. So hopefully that shows you what's wrong with this amplifier and we're going to try to figure out uh, what's actually causing that today. All right, so here's the schematic for this unit and this is uh, it's a Sam's Photo Fact. I found this one for the 528.59960. And unlike the single-ended schematic I showed you last time, this one actually here um, shows both the left channel here in the green box I drew and the right channel here in the blue box that I, I drew. Then you've got down here in the purple box, basically this power supply here that ultimately is you know feeding in via the transformer. Um, it has a power plug here on the unit that would have failed at, fed out and went to the AM FM chassis. Well, I've disconnected all that. So basically most of this is not in use down here. And then this part up here feeds the various sections, 265 volt section, 290 volt section, 310 volt section, feeding to various points inside of this amplifier. And then you've got this little table down here and it's just a, it's a, it's a guide from the manufacturer here that says, hey, or probably from Sam's to be more honest, if you measure between this pin and this pin, these are the resistances you should see. Or if you measure between ground and these pins, these are the resistances you should see, things of that nature. Just gives you some troubleshooting tips here. And then over here, this is um, showing some windings for different models. So um, if this had been used in a different type model, it shows here the different model of console units, how it might have been wired up differently on the output or whatnot. But I think we can ignore most of that for um, for today's purposes because this we're just going to be working with a single speaker, which would be you know one of these here. So. If we, let's just take a look at the left channel here, okay? We're feeding in, and I've kind of jumpered and bypassed these original, and I'm just feeding straight in here into this 0.02 capacitor, and the other side's going to ground. 
right then we're going into what's called af amp one here uh, this is the audio frequency amplifier number one which is half of a 12 ax7 okay v11 right here right then the other half of that same tube gets used here as the phase inverter in other words this this is a a specially biased configuration of this tube that when you feed into it it splits the signal in half. The positive peaks of the waves go one direction up this way through this 0.02 into 16 BQ5. The other, the bottom, the negative portions of the wave get split off here of the cathode of this unit through this 0 0.02 coupling capacitor right in through this grid leak resistor right into this 16 BQ5. And then, so you're amplifying the positive peaks of the waveform with that tube, the negative peaks of the waveform with this tube, that's where you get the terms push-pull. And then these two signals get added back together in the special wiring um, on the primary winding here of the output transformer. That's why a push-pull output transformer um, is different. You always pull off the center of it up to B+. Plus. And by bringing those two halves of the signal together here, they get superimposed on top of each other and come on the output here and they go to the speaker, um, which then plays the music, much amplified from what came in here on the input of this unit. So with that, we're going to go over to the bench now. We're just going to start walking our ways left to right here, just like we did on the other one, until we can find a difference between channel, you know, the left channel and the right channel. And then we'll know kind of which part of the amplifier our problem lies. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to figure out, first off, I like this con concept of conquer and divide, okay? So which channel is having the problem? Because then I can rule out almost half of this amplifier, right? One of these 12AX7s goes to one channel, the other goes to the other channel. One set of these 6B5, 5, BQ5 goes to one, the other to the other. So I can almost rule out half of the amplifier just by knowing which channel is having the problem. And that's simple enough. Let's look up here. We've got two signals here. It's a really easy thing to do. Let's go over here and reach and unplug one of the inputs. We'll either get it right or wrong. And in this case, hmm, what just happened there? Well, we lost our oscilloscope trigger is what happened. So if you'll notice channel one here went flat, channel two still here. But if you'll notice over here, I'm triggering on channel one. So one thing I could do is turn off, oops, I could turn off channel one here, then I could change so I'm triggering on channel two, and all of a sudden I have a nice signal. But really what I want to know is it's not that channel. So the little, the wire feeding in here that's orange and red, I know that is not the one. Um, the one having the problem is feeding in here on the blue one. But now, keep in mind, I'm still going to be able to compare side to side. I just know which side has the problem and which side doesn't at this point. Let's take a look here. So we know that the uh, the signal coming in on the red line is the one having the problem, right? And let's take a look at the schematic here real quick, okay? So you, I've got a little green line drawn. You notice the signal's coming here on the input, and I replaced this funky little jack with uh, some RCA jacks here on the back. So we come in on the input, we feed across, we go through this 0 0.02 microfarad capacitor. Then we feed straight across here and we go into the grid of AF amplifier one. Now, keep in mind, this this and this is all within one glass envelope here on one of the 12AX7s. This is all within a glass envelope on the other. And I could have drawn the same green line down here coming straight in. So the first place I want to measure is on pin two of each of these tubes. I want to make sure something with this isn't killing me or maybe this, uh, the grid leak resistor here isn't killing me. So I'm going to connect right at the pin here, number two, on both sides of this. We use the yellow banded oscilloscope plug, which goes up here to channel one. I'm going to clip it over here on, and this is a little complicated the way this works, but it feeds down, it ties here, then there's a green wire that feeds over, it actually ties onto this other jack. But this right here is the 0.02 capacitor on the front end right here. So I'm just going to clip on the other side of it uh, the best I can here. I'm actually going to clip on the resistor beside of it that's the 470K that's tied right beside of it. It's the same point electrically. And then the same thing over here. On this side, I'm going to come in and I'm going to clip 
right down here. Okay, now let's take a look at what we've got here, okay? And if I turn my meter off, clear display, you can see here that we've got two signals feeding into the amplifier now. Um, on the other side here, on the other side of the coupling capacitor on the input, on the other side of this little grid leak resistor right here. And if you'll notice, if I move them on top of each other, I have two perfect signals feeding into this amplifier that are equal here, all the way up to the grid of the tubes. All right, so let's go back to the schematic. All right, so if we take a look here, we basically tested at these two red dots and we had perfectly matched signal. So um, what I'm gonna do is come to the output of this, which is actually comes off the plate here, right? Same on this one, comes off the plate. So I'm gonna connect on the little section that goes between pin one of this tube. And if you'll notice, this is a straight line. There's no coupling capacitor, there's no anything between number, pin number two and seven uh, inside of this one glass envelope. So what you'll see here, you can see this little wire that goes across right here that I'm pointing at. It just goes from pin number two to pin number seven. Same thing here, right here it goes number seven over to pin number two on this tube. So we're gonna connect our oscilloscope probe now on both of those. Okay, so same thing here. I'm gonna just connect this oscilloscope probe right in between on right here and uh oh notice what happened here we went really big on our signal here all right now we're triggering on channel two right now but if i changed it to channel one you'll notice what happened we locked in on that signal and the same thing over here you notice i see some little bitty lines telling me this thing's really big interesting what have we got going on here so we've got one signal larger than the other. And I will promise you that if you have a signal mismatch early on in your amplifier, it does nothing but get worse as it goes through the amplifier. So you could say, well, wow, I wonder if that's what's causing this. Um, you know, already at the first stage of the first you know, gain tube of the amplifier, first gain stage, we've already got a big mismatch in signal, thus that must be carrying through the amplifier. And on the other side, you know, it's coming out with the signal difference. Well, that would be a very logical thing to think. And honestly, it was the first thought I had, but in reality, that's not the case here. If I go back down and follow <laughs> the probe here, okay? If you notice the one that looks here at the bottom is tied to the yellow, which is tied to the yellow over here, which is ultimately tied to the good line, not the bad line. So then you go, hmm, well then it's not the imbalance here. If you'll notice though, these signals, this is a beautiful sine wave right here, okay? This is an ugly sine wave. I want you to look at how fat this is up top here, right? Let's just pick a point. If you, if you kind of centered, let me turn off the other channel, okay? So if you kind of centered this around the uh, the middle of the scope here. If you'll notice how fat and wide the signal is from here, it's, you know, I could count it here. It's, it's at least two bars right here at this level. We'll come down and count here at the equal amount going downward. We're only a little over a bar and one tick wide. It's a very non-symmetrical sine wave at this point, and it's kind of blown out of proportion. And this is actually the bad signal not this one. This one is working fine through the amplifier. This other one, already out of distortion, maybe overdriving, maybe overdriving the rest of the amp stage, which is creating the ugliness early on and whatnot. So it's this one I've got to fix here at this point. All right, let's take a look at how we might diagnose the problem. So we know that sitting here at this point, from an AC standpoint, we have a matching signal with down here, okay? And then we know once it goes through this AF amp, uh, the first gain stage here, that coming out the other side here, we do not have a symmetrical signal. So something's got to be out of whack uh, with this channel here. So what we're going to do is a couple things. One, I'm going to check the resistance between this point and ground to make sure this 470 ohm 
uh, matches up on both sides. Although the fact that the signal was similar there, I believe I believe that one's going to be okay. Next thing I'm going to check over here is I'm going to check using a digital multimeter between this point and ground to make sure I've got 2700 ohms. Same over here, okay? Um, so what I'm really measuring there is the cathode resistor. And then at that point, I'm going to measure the plate voltage here on both of these tubes. Make sure I've got the same amount of voltage, which is basically right here where this green dot is. I'm also going to check and make sure that this 470 ohm resistor is 470 ohms. Um, right here, the plate load resistor. And then I'm also going to make sure that I've got 265 volts sitting here. Uh, coming from the power supply. If you'll notice down here, it feeds out 265 volts, which connects to this point. I'm going to make sure that I've got 265 volts on both sides. So I'm just making sure that all the voltages and resistances around this are symmetrical. Now, I told you already, I've, I've replaced the tube or checked the tubes here. And, I, and so I know it's not in the tubes itself. There is one other thing that it could be. If you'll notice this little point right here, right on top of the cathode resistor, it feeds over, goes all the way over through this little network here, a resistor and a capacitor, which, which is a filter, okay? And it is tied back into the output. In other words, this is our feedback loop. So if, if this thing was feeding a different amount of feedback on one channel than the other, it could cause an imbalance as well. So I'm going to do some things like check the value of this resistor, maybe check the AC signal as it's flowing back across here and whatnot. So we're just going to go hit the bench and do a good little bit of diagnosing here just on this first gain stage. All right, back on the bench here. If you'll notice, I've just got a digital multimeter hooked up here, laid down. And if you'll notice the black lead, I've got a little uh, clip on and I'm clipping it to a ground lug here and the other probe I'm just going to be able to probe around here with this little tip. I can tell you a combination of oscilloscope and good digital multimeter and there's not much of anything I can't solve um, or you couldn't solve on an audio amplifier without the two. So what I'm going to be doing is checking between various points and ground basically right now. Let's start out over here on pin number two which will be the grid here. And if you'll notice, I've got 469 point whatever ohms. And if I come over here to pin number two on this tube, I have 470 ohms. So within a few percent, um, we're good to go there. All right, so that was pin number two and pin number two here. Now let's go check out pin number three, which will be the cathode to ground, right? All right, 2.641 ohms, K ohms, excuse me. And on the other tube over here, 2.637, so pretty much identical on both sides. This does have listed a um, 2700 ohm resistor. Change the bias slightly by you know, this 2.64K, but they're close enough. That's they're, they're symmetrical, in other words. The, the problem's not likely lying there with that. You know, if you clip on pin 1 here, you don't get a resistance reading to ground, and that's because on pin number 1 here, it comes back through this 470K all the way through the power supply. So what I'm going to do there is I'm going to clip on this middle lead here and then I want to measure across that resistor going back to the power supply. Whoops. And I've got to discharge the uh, just charge these capacitors a little bit. So anytime you've had a unit on and then you go and turn it off um, you can have still a little bit of you know load and charge on the actual capacitors in the unit which will mess with your resistance readings. So I'm just using the little wand here to discharge all the capacitors in this unit for a minute and we'll get back to testing here. So if we come back over here and we test um, across this 470 ohm resistor here. Okay, I had to hook the ground lead back up, but the 470 ohm resistor goes from here to here. And if you'll notice, what do I have here? 470 ohms. Let's do the same on the other side here on this other one. Uh, between there and I believe it is right here. What do we have? 470 ohms. So we're still good to go here um, all the way up through and we've tested the value of this resistor. Now what I want to start testing are some voltages at this point. So I'm going to switch my voltmeter over to volts here and I'm going to clip one side to ground and we're actually going to power this unit up. And this is where you especially keep just one hand only in here. 
Um, and I'm going to measure, first off, I'm going to measure pin 1 of each of these, which should have around 100 volts on it. Okay. Okay. What have we got there? 104, 105 volts. The reason the volt's a little higher than what the schematic's reading is because we're feeding in more. This the schematic was probably designed for, I'm guessing here, let's see if it tells on the front end, um, probably 110 or 117 volts, and we're feeding it more like 120. So let's go measure... Okay, slight indifference on one tube here versus the other, 105 volts, 107 volts. It's not enough to cause the problem that we're having right now, so I'm, I'm good here. Let's measure on the other side of this uh, cathode resistor here. So right here, right here, we've got 282 volts on this one, and if I measure on the other side of this one, I've got 282 volts. And if you'll notice, I'm measuring this point right here that's marked 265. Well, 265 is now 282 because of uh, the increased input voltage into this unit, but it's, it's not going to hurt. That's, that's not our problem. So I've kind of checked this unit out on the front end now, and I'm not finding any difference between this tube and this tube. So then what I want to start looking at next is, remember I talked about it could be in this feedback loop here, coming across, causing our problem. Okay, I turned the power off and discharged everything again. So what I'm measuring now is across this feedback resistor. And if you'll notice, I've got 2.641k ohms, okay? And I'm gonna measure the other side over here as well across its feedback resistor. Sorry, you guys are getting live over the bench troubleshooting. 2.638, so pretty identical. And you may wonder, well, why? Why when I measure across this resistor mark did I not get 120K? Well, here, here is exactly why, okay? Um, if you'll notice, one side of this resistor and the other side, one side here feeds down, okay? Goes through the secondary winding back to ground. The other side here comes all the way back around, goes through this 2.7K ohm resistance to ground. So in parallel with this 120, I'm reading the winding resistance of the second, which is around 0.7 ohms, and that 2.64 ohms here. So if you put 2.64 ohms in parallel with 120K, guess what you end up with? <laughs> 2.638, okay? So I'm, I'm reading two things in parallel there. But here's what's key, okay? What is totally key on this scenario is the fact, as you can see here, 2.642, that they're symmetrical, they're close, okay, within just a few percent of each other. So what that's telling me is I likely don't have a problem in this feedback because if I, if I take into account the output transformer and this little resistor here, everything's matching up between the two sides. So, well, where the heck does my problem lie? Let's go back to the oscilloscope. All right, so we're clipped here now, um, back between, if you can see here, pin number one coming out of the first amp and going into pin number seven on the uh, phase inverter here and the same on the other tube. So what you'll see here is that um, one of these nice clean sine wave, oops, the one down here at the bottom, the one on the top, um, much, much wider up here than it is here in the, on the peaks than the valleys, okay? So a, a very distorted sine wave. And, you know, we've checked all the voltages now and all the um, bias and everything relating to this front end tube, and we haven't found anything out of the ordinary or out of sorts. We've also checked that this little feedback loop right here, uh, this 120K resistor, is intact and in good shape. So where else might the problem lie? Well, you got to take into account just because this feedback loop um, isn't broken, possibly what is being fed back is ultimately the cause of our problem. So maybe the problem lies between here and here, okay? And the fact that it's getting distorted somewhere in here, we're then feeding that little bit of distortion back to the input, causing the first stage, even though it doesn't have a problem, to look like it does. So I think we've learned a valuable lesson here in the last few minutes. Around, is it, you know, the effect or the cause here? Or you could look at it like, is it the, the, um, the symptom <laughs> or the actual illness that's causing us the issue? And in this case, 
This is nothing more than a symptom of a problem that likely lies in here. It, because of the feedback loop, it's manifesting itself back into the earlier stages, okay? So what we need to do is continue troubleshooting through the rest of this amp. Now, one approach that I would likely take if it was an easy approach would be to just disconnect the feedback loop, okay? It'll likely, um, you know, increase the gain of the amplifier slightly if you do that, might, might narrow the bandwidth of the amplifier a little bit if you do that, but at the end of the day, you would then be able to track through and find the issue fairly easily because you've gotten rid of this feedback loop that's giving the false impression back to the beginning of a problem that may lie on up in here a little bit. If you can grasp that concept, let's get down here and see if we can figure out a little bit of an approach for this. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna go back and I'm gonna clip where the feedback loop feeds backwards into this amplifier, okay? Not to get shocked, okay. Let's, let's adjust the amplitude here on our signal. So this is the really small signal. You can see we're down here at 20, um, millivolts per division here, okay? Um, but you can see the top of this one is whacked off and thus the issue that we're having here throughout the amplifier. So, okay, if you kind of follow the schematic here, what we've got happening is coming off of the secondary winding here of the uh, output transformer, we feed up into this uh, little capacitor, little resistor network, and we feed back across and we feed into the cathode here of this tube. Let me show you what that actually looks like on the amp, though. It's not quite as clean as that. So right here is the only wire going to the output um, on this channel, and it feeds across here, and it comes over and it ties onto this lug right here, okay? And then tying from this lug, this yellow wire goes down and comes out of this output transformer. And then what we have happen is we have a resistor that feeds off of this, and then we've got this little capacitor right here that feeds off of it down to the tube pins. So it's not quite so easy to just cut yourself in line here, because if I cut this wire, then I've lost my connectivity back to my transformer. And if I cut this wire, I've lost connectivity from my transformer to that spot. The only way to really jump in line here is to cut loose this capacitor and this resistor. And it's, it's, a, it's in a tight spot and it'd be a good bit of soldering and whatnot to do that on both channels. So if I have to, I will, but I thought I would take another approach before I got to that point, okay? And that approach is going to involve me just trying to follow the signal along and see if I can figure out where it's out of whack using the scope probes. And I'm going to use my digital multimeter to check a lot of values along the way. We may be able to solve the problem that way without unsoldering this feedback loop. Um, but there again, if we need to at the end of it all, we certainly can. What we've got here is I'm clipped on to the output now. Um, of the phase inverter. Uh, one I'm, on, I'm on one channel of the amplifier here, and what I'm clipped on to here is pin six and pin eight coming out. So the plate of this, or anode of this, feeding through the coupling capacitor into this six PQ5, and I'm clipped on to here the cathode of this, which is feeding through this uh, coupling capacitor into this six PQ5. You may say, wow, that's kind of a funky looking uh, signal you've got going on there, Mark, right? Well, if you kind of take a look at it this way, make me a little easier to see, really what we've got is this phase inverter where on one half of the signal, we're feeding the positive peaks and the other half, we're feeding the negative peak. Pause now and take a look on the other channel at this. We're just gonna go back and forth between each channel and walk our way along. Okay, we're clipped onto the other channel now and if you'll notice a similar story here, except for, um, you know, this one's super ugly dip down here on the bottom. So what, what I'm on is, you know, I'm on the bad channel right here, okay? And so the, you're seeing kind of the, you know, the positive and negative peaks here split up, split up and I can't, I can go a little smaller here, make them, you can see them a little better, but you kind of get the idea. But this one's got some serious, serious ugliness to it and it's, it's distorted and, and out of whack at this point in time. So let's move on to the next spot, back on over to the other channel now. I'm at the beginning right now of the 6BQ5 right along in here. 
and at the beginning of the 6BQ5 right here, okay? And things are looking fairly normal there, right? And that's looking pretty symmetrical at this point. If you look at the height of them compared to each other, they're pretty much in line with each other. Um, you're getting the positive peaks on one side, the negative peaks on the other here. All right, now I'm back over on the bad channel. The same thing here. I'm looking here at uh, the input of this 6BQ5 and the input of this 6BQ5. And it's, it's still ugly. So what I've learned here is that it's, it's hard to find the problem now with just an oscilloscope because that feed, I don't know if the problem existed somewhere I just looked or whether I'm just validating that the problem exists because it, it, it's happening somewhere and it's getting fed back to the beginning and it's causing this effect here. So I really didn't learn a lot from the oscilloscope other than I validated that this, this distortion is feeding all the way through. So let's go back to our digital multimeter here. Okay, we're starting with our digital multimeter again. I'm going to go back and discharge the capacitors in this unit. And then what we're going to do is hook our ground lead up here to ground. We're going to put our digital multimeter back up here on the bench. We're going to put it on ohms resistance. And now we're going to start working our way through this unit. So if you'll notice on the phase inverter here, the symmetry that exists. In other words, this phase inverter is kind of suspended halfway between the power supply B plus voltage and ground. And they're doing that by between the cathode here, the output, they've got 100K to ground, okay? Between the, the anode here and the B plus, they've got 100K. So this thing's kind of suspended in the middle. And then on, on the output here, on the other side of the coupling capacitors, if you'll notice, we're kind of tied back here, uh, 270K to ground, 270K to ground. So we should be able to measure on this side of this coupling capacitor here and measure 100K. And then we should be able to measure from pin 6 here up to where it goes to B plus and get the 100K. Let's do that real quick. So um, on this tube right here, pin 6, pin 6 here going to the B plus would be that. What have we got? 100K. And then between pin 8 and ground, we've got what? 100K. All right, let's do that on the other side here as well. If we come back over here to pin 6 here and read, we've got 100K. And between pin 8 and ground, what do we have? Oops. We have five major measure pin number eight. We've got 100K. Now let's jump on the other side of this coupling capacitor here and here. Let's measure from here to ground and here to ground, okay? So that'll be right on the beginning of the grid stopper here. So on this channel, what do I have? 270 ohms going to ground. On this channel, Hmm. Interesting. I have open link. Very, very interesting here. <laughs> um, wow. So there's something about this 270 ohm resistor here on this other channel that's that's not right. And, and this is, we know this is the bad side here. So I'm just going to kind of clip... Uh, I'm going to measure here because this is a little bit of divider network. 270K. If I go on the other side of it, I'm open link. I've got 270K on the resistor. Between this point and the resistor, I'm open link. Let me see if I can... <laughs> well, you got to love this stuff when you find out... The person that made the mistake is yourself. Look at that. Never got the end of this resistor soldered down um, when I wrapped it around this post right here to, uh, to make that connection. So flat out, it was a wiring issue on my part when I did this conversion. I probably put all these resistors in place and then went to solder them in different locations 
and just didn't get that one soldered right. Let's, let's solder that back in and see what it does to the amplifier. Oh boy. I make myself look like an idiot in front of all my loyal viewers here. <laughs> but you know, it's because we're human beings and this is what happens. And uh, sometimes we have to troubleshoot our own problems and uh, figure out where we make our mistakes and we learn from them. All right, check it out. We're measuring back now on the output. I'm feeding back from the dummy load. Feeding into the unit. Small signal. Great big signal all the way to the point that you'll notice starting to uh, starting to get a little shaky here on the top end, but it's all happening together. It's beautifully symmetrical all the way through. We have solved our problem by having a resistor not soldered in, causing an imbalance, causing an imbalance here, right between this point and this point and ground with this little divider network feeding into the output tubes here. One side was lifted up, not grounded, causing this imbalance going in here, which was causing an imbalance on the output, which was feeding back to the input, making the input signal look bad, and kind of compounding the issue as it went through the circuit. This amplifier is looking pretty darn beautiful. So, hope you guys learned something. We used a combination of the oscilloscope and some uh, digital multimeter skills here. Troubleshot our issue and Onward, next video, gonna be a solid state unit, going to use digital uh, digital oscilloscope and try to do that over the next week or two. Thanks for watching everybody. Hope you're having fun with this series.